The Buddha said there are three kinds of karma, bodily, verbal, mental. In some passages when he's talking about the kind of karma that leads to rebirth, he calls them bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication, mental fabrication. But there are also passages in the canon that talk about bodily, verbal, mental fabrication in terms of what you experience as you meditate. Bodily fabrication is the breath. Verbal is directed thought and evaluation as you talk to yourself about the breath. Mental fabrication is composed of feelings and perceptions. The feeling tones you have right here, pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful. And then the perceptions are the images you hold in mind that help you stay with the breath, the marker of the mind, the signpost. Or the way you visualize to yourself how the breath goes through the body. Now the question is, are those two different types of fabrication in terms of rebirth and in terms of the meditation related or not? Scholars like to say that they're not. But what advantage do you gain from that idea? It's more useful to realize that what you're experiencing right now, as you try to put this state of concentration together, is the root of the bodily, verbal, and mental actions that could lead to rebirth. After all, to move your body, you have to breathe. To speak, you have to engage in direct thought and evaluation. And to think, you need feelings and perceptions. Notice that thinking here covers emotions. That's where the feelings come in. So you've got the sprouts of those things right here. And you can deal with them directly right here. This is one of the whole points of the meditation. If in order to understand rebirth or understand karma, you had to be aware of the entire universe, it would take a long, long time to get there. The canon tells the story of a deva who tried to stride from one end of the universe to the other. And even after a life even after a deva lifetime didn't make it. The universe is awfully big. But you realize you can go to the different spots of the universe through your actions. And where do your actions come from? These little events right here, right now, the fabrications going on in the mind right here, right now. Fabrications in the body. So you don't have to look anywhere else. Look right here. And be fully sensitive to what you sense right here. It is useful to have an intellectual framework or a thought framework, conceptual framework, to give you some ideas of where, where to look. But the actual experience, the raw data, is right here. And you're closest to the real thing as you stay on this level, what the Buddha calls name and form. I've been reading a book recently saying that all of our language is metaphorical. And the metaphors get really deep into our, our experiences, so deep that it's hard to say that we don't have any experience that hasn't been colored by our culture. But there is one experience that is prior to culture, and that's your pain. And of course, what do we do to get rid of the pain? Well, that's where we start getting engaged in culture. We look around try to find others to help us. We try to communicate with them. But the pain is raw data. Fortunately, pleasure is also raw data. If something feels really good, you don't need it. a cultural overlay or a verbal overlay to tell you that it's good. Just that some of the overlays may get in the way of appreciating that the sense of well-being that you can have right here. This is one of the reasons why John Munn told his students that when they came to practice with him, especially the ones who had a background in scholarly Buddhism, to put their knowledge in the trunk, seal it away, and just learn how to be right here, 
sense right here, what's going on right here, in terms of cause and effect. In other words, you don't put all of your knowledge away. You have some place in the back of the mind which you know a little bit about the Four Noble Truths. That stress, dukkha, stress, pain, whatever, suffering, is something that you do through your clinging. And the reason you cling is because you crave. But that craving can be put an end to by developing the path. So you've got unskillful causes, like the different kinds of craving, and skillful causes, the different factors of the path, and then the results of those two. That gives you the Four Noble Truths. That right there is enough. Because these truths point you to what you're doing right now and where you may want to look to improve what you're doing. And you test the results as to whether what you're doing counts as a cause of suffering or part of the path by the feeling tone that you give rise to. Because the path is composed of, among other things, right concentration. And it's interesting when the Buddha defines the different jhanas. He doesn't say first jhana is accompanied by pleasure or rapture, or the fourth jhana is accompanied by equanimity. He says first jhana, pleasure and rapture accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. The pleasure and rapture are the primary part of the experience, just as the equanimity is the primary part of the experience in the fourth jhana. These are things you feel. These are things you sense. And you have to learn how to get in touch with this level of your awareness. Feel at home with it. As you get more and more here, then you begin to have a little bit less trust in your perceptions, the labels that you have for things. You give more and more trust to how things feel right here. As you watch yourself act, and then look at the results. And as you stay at this level, then when questions come up as to what to do to get more skillful, you look back on the knowledge you've gained from studying the Dhamma. And from this perspective, you're in a much better position to decide what's useful and what's not. So it's not that you totally discard what you've learned. You just want to move into this new country, the country of how you experience things directly, right here, as you try to bring your awareness to the breath in a way that, where they fit together well, and the mind can settle down. And it feels so good being here that you don't feel the nervous need to keep on thinking. Just enough thought to keep you here, the perception of breath, breath, whole body, whole body, whatever holds you here. And as you're here, then you look back on your concepts that you picked up from reading and studying, listening to the Dharma, and you see them from a new angle. And you'll be much closer to seeing them in a way that's really useful. So this is your touchstone that helps you sort through whatever Dharma knowledge you have. It's touched on a name and form right here, right now. And it helps to settle a lot of issues, pull you out of a lot of issues as well. I received a very sad letter today from a guy who's struggling with the teachings on no self, non self. He says the idea that the Buddha wants you to put that issue up, whether there is, exists a self or doesn't exist a self aside. That's very attractive to him. But before he goes there, he wants to figure out, well, what are these people who say there is no self? What do they have to say? And he was saying that the more he read, the more confused he got, and the more desperate he was getting, because someone had told him that if you don't understand no self, then there's no way of getting liberation. 
He was getting very depressed. So I wrote back immediately, told him, one, question those people who say that you have to understand no self to gain liberation. Even just anatta, regardless of how you translate it. In the case of the five brethren, it wasn't even brought up until after they had gained stream entry. You think of all the people who gained awakening from listening to the graduated discourse. It doesn't end in the three characteristics. It ends in the Four Noble Truths, cause and effect around stress and suffering, and the path to the end of suffering. In other words, looking directly at what you're doing right here, right now. That's where these questions get answered. That's the framework that helps you to answer them. So look to the concentration as your place to settle in and get the correct viewpoint on right view and all the other things you've learned about the Dharma. Because as you're dealing with the realities right here, you begin to see which issues are genuine issues and which ones are just distraction, or worse than distraction. As the Buddha said, some of them are a tangle of views, a jungle of views, a writhing, a wilderness of views. Getting them uncomfortable, settled down right here, feeling at home right here. That helps you to slash your way through the jungle. And not get caught by the vines. <laughs>